Hello, and welcome to Getting It Right, a new podcast from National Review. I'm Raihan Salam of National Review and the National Review Institute, and I'm joined today by my good friend, Patrick Brennan. I'm Patrick Brennan of National Review, formerly of the National Review Institute. Raihan and I collaborate on a blog on National Review Online called The Agenda, which focuses on domestic policy, and that will be the main thrust of Getting It Right. Indeed. And today, Pat and I have been talking a lot about immigration. Immigration uh, has generally not been the kind of number one issue on the minds of most Americans. But over the last few weeks, it's really vaulted to the front pages. It's uh, something that people are talking about around the water cooler. People are just thinking about it very hard, uh, partly because, you know, you have this enormous crisis at the border. And, you know, one of the reasons this crisis at the border is such a big deal is that it kind of seems to speak to a general breakdown of authority, right? I mean, uh, what else do you think it is? I mean, is that the only reason immigration is front of mind right now? Uh, yeah, I think that's what brought it, um, brought it to the forefront. Although it's been almost sort of dizzying this year as a as a voracious media consumer, the, the speed with which we move on from story to story. So America at various points has been concerned with, uh, the, you know, terrorism problem in northern Nigeria, been obsessed with a, a trade that involved the U.S. getting a U.S. Marine home or whatever, and uh, then with the VA. And this has stuck, and I think the reason it has stuck is that the president and congressional Democrats uh, have tried to make an issue out of it. And th so it's it's going to continue because this could have easily been, oh, here are these 20,000 kids at the border. That was the story. And then it had disappeared. But it, it seems fairly clear that the president and congressional Democrats want to want this issue to continue on uh, through the fall uh, and in ways that, the, that these other sort of flash in the pan issues have not been politically advantageous. Even the VA, not a good thing for for liberals. But this they think that this could be politically useful. It's amazing. Uh, immigration reform, uh, this debate over basically the same kind of immigration reform has been with us for years and years. We've been debating this since the second Bush term. Uh, and, you know, back then, uh, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, this was kind of, you know, Bush's second term gambit. Uh, he had lost Congress, and he thought that this was, you know, something that he could. It was actually before he lost Congress, I guess. And then he actually lost the support of a ton of Republicans. This was part of what alienated a lot of Republicans from Bush. And then President Obama comes in, and he actually introduces an immigration reform proposal that's pretty strikingly similar to what George W. Bush advanced, which kind of tells you something about elites on the Democratic side and on the Republican side. They seem to have roughly the same kind of consensus, and the idea is that. You know, you legalize a lot of the unauthorized folks, uh, and you have a future immigration policy that's pretty tailored to the needs of big business groups. Uh, do you find that kind of odd that, you know, you kind of have basically the same formula uh, for the Bush Republicans and for the Obama Democrats? Well, it's interesting because there are lots of enduring ideas in politics, but they're usually because certain idea, you know, ideological factions really like certain ideas. Um but here, yeah, I think it's very much tied to particular interests, um, and because it's sort of a durable, uh, you know, it it it, it, co it cobbles together sort of just enough to get a majority or a near majority or a, a, a viable share of the House and the Senate, um, and you you sort of have to do it again and again because you had an amnesty in the 1980s, and but then you sort of you just couple that with higher immigration levels, and it sort of boosts immigration levels in the short term. And then, you know, and then you just do it again. And there's always businesses always want big business always wants more immigration. Um, and and, you know, the, the ethnic pressure groups always, always want more immigration. They always want another legalization. So you can sort of see why they are continually interested. And it's also, I think, um, a very straightforward way for people to convey that they are large hearted, decent people. Uh, and I think that, you know, in our politics, that matters a lot. It matters more to some people than others, but it, it matters a lot. I certainly find this with a lot of conservatives and Republicans uh, for whom, you know, let's say they really favor tax cuts. They favor all kinds of positions that liberals, let's say, uh, you know, find offensive or find hard hearted. But then they can say, but wait a second, you know, I, I believe that we should have pretty open borders. And that's a very clear way for them to convey a few things at once. One, that they're compassionate, decent people, um, you know, who kind of love people from the developing world or whatever else. Uh, and also that they're not racist. Racists. Yes. And I think that that's actually a really, really big part of this debate. And I think it's a big part of why um, Democrats like raising this issue in a political climate in which, you know, the Democratic Party is not 
you know, uh, the political party, uh, you know, as a political party, they're doing just fine. But I think that, you know, under President Obama, a president who's not necessarily universally praised at the moment for his competence or whatever else, the one thing that they can say that can help hold their coalition together is that, well, these guys on the other side of the fence uh, are not the other side of the fence, the other side of the aisle uh, are racists. Uh, and, and, and that's not, you know, that's not the whole argument. I don't want to say that. But I think that that's really implicitly a big part of this. For pro-immigration folks on, uh, you know, among Republicans and among Democrats. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and so, as a political matter, what you see is is um, the president and Democrats going with what sort of looks like their, you know, is is similar in some ways to their 2012 campaign strategy, which is to move away from the issues and their record and their plans and shift to these kind of social issues, which they they can they can play very effectively. Um, and therefore, it takes some degree of confidence from Republicans or from immigration skeptics, uh, immig- comprehensive immigration reform skeptics, um, to be willing to make a policy-focused argument against, look, there are real concerns about why we wouldn't want to let in vastly more um, low-skilled immigrants. Uh, and that is not so, – that is a very rare um, – that's a rarely made argument. Uh, you get it certainly more in the House just because a lot of conservatives in the House with um, – with whom I probably have a lot of policy disagreements, um, are the rare the rare skeptics of this um, sort of bipartisan Im- Im- elite immigration consensus, and there's just about only one of them in the in the U.S. Senate, um, Jeff Sessions, who is the subject of a profile by Eliana Johnson in the most recent issue of National Review, which will be on National Review Online presently. Um, but but he's he he really frames the immigration debate in an economically populist way. And in a way that that you know it, it's resonated with enough people to keep it from passing in the House. So you know he couldn't stop it in the Senate. But. The Reason uh, Foundation does these big surveys, uh, these Reason Roop surveys, and what I really like about their surveys is that they're different from other polls because they try to present uh, their respondents with choices. So it's kind of like, okay, you can do X or Y, but you know, you have there have to there has to be some kind of constraint. You know, do you still favor this if you have to pay taxes for this or something like that? And they did this survey, it must have been over a year ago, of immigration. And what I what I found, you know, while digging into the guts of the survey that was really interesting is that basically Republicans and Democrats, self-identified Republicans and Democrats, don't have really different views about future immigration, like how much skilled immigration, how much less skilled immigration there should be, et cetera. They, you know, generally, you know, it's a minority that wants to really increase it dramatically, you know, kind of generally people want to keep the numbers the same, whatever else. The big difference is on um, how you treat the illegal immigrant population that we have right now. And uh, it turns out the Democrats uh, want to be more generous to them, and Republicans, generally speaking, are kind of less inclined to be generous in terms of offering legalization or whatever else. And I found that very interesting because, you know, basically the whole immigration debate we have is almost entirely about this kind of legalization question. And that's what, you know, gets Republicans worked up a lot and, you know, kind of, you know, right or wrong. Um, But the thing is that it it actually seems to me that that future question, the number of people you allow into the country is actually a pretty big deal. And there you actually have a pretty broad consensus. Uh, You know, it's a pretty small minority. I think the highest it's been is like 27 percent in the last 50 years of Gallup surveys, but, you know, uh, you know, who actually want to increase immigration levels significantly. That seems incredible to me because the Senate bill would actually double legal immigration. And, you know, I actually probably favor somewhat more legal immigration than a lot of other people do. I, I wanted to be high skilled, but regardless, but that's amazing that we just haven't talked about that aspect of it at all. It just doesn't really wind up being a part of the debate. Yeah, I mean, and I, uh, it, it, it was completely neglected. It was sort of one of the big policy changes that was in the Gang of Eight bill that wasn't um, – that we just wasn't discussed uh, because in many ways you can look at legalization as not actually dramatically changing the, this, the facts on the ground. I mean illegal immigrants are not about to leave for the most part. So the fact that if they then receive legal status, it'll it, – well, it probably would increase – future illegal immigration, but it wouldn't really change their lives dramatically. But all of a sudden, it would mean that you're increasing the rate of immigration significantly. I think it was something like you'd go from, I mean, it was from, from maybe a million a year to 1.5 million a year or something. I mean, it was, it was pretty dramatic. The number that I remember is that relative to the status quo, the Senate bill would increase the U.S. population by like 10 million over the next 10-year period. I mean, that, that's, 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 right. that's kind of, that's, that's quite dramatic. Uh, but 
regardless. I mean, it, 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 and I think that my theory about this is that the reason why legalization resonates so much is that it actually is this very powerful argument for the legalization advocates. Uh, because when you're looking at a lot of different social movements we've had in the United States over the last, let's say, you know, 20 years, they've kind of made progress um, by appealing to our sympathy to people that we can know and see. So when you think about the idea of the DREAM Act, the idea of the DREAM Act is that, hey, there are these young people, they're just like you and me, they're Americans, they grew up here, they speak English, you know, it's, this is their country. The idea that we should deport these people is profoundly inhumane. And you start from that point, and the DREAM Act had all these other things like, okay, well, if people you know, have English language fluency, if they serve in the military, uh, if they, you know, kind of go to community college, all these other things that are meant to project to you that, you know, these are good, decent, solid citizens, or, you know, solid citizen material, let's say. But the thing is that the people who favor legalization, I think if you really press them on this point, um, hey, what if someone doesn't speak English particularly well? Or what if they don't want to join the military because they're pacifists? Or what if, uh, you know, kind of they decided not to go to college because it wasn't for them? I mean, do you really want to deport them? That, and, and, and you'll never get anyone to say, oh, yeah, sure, just throw them out. Yeah, I mean, you know, really, it's an entering wedge. It's a way to change the way the conversation goes. And I think that, you know, frankly, um, I think that the pro-legalization folks have been extremely effective at that, partly because um, it's very hard for people to think in abstract terms. When you're pointing to people who are, um, you know, the victims, uh, you know, quote unquote, of this policy. But the thing is that any immigration enforcement is going to create victims because the truth is that there are all kinds of people from all over the world who want to come here for perfectly good reasons. They don't want to murder people. They don't want to like steal Pat's, you know, beret or something like that. I mean, they want to come here to work. But the thing is that we have immigration laws for our purposes and for our national interests. And I think that that abstraction that we kind of make these policies in our national interest, it's just really, really hard when faced with this idea that, hey, here's a tragic story of a person who's going to be hurt by this policy. And like the problem is that, you know, the people who, let's say, have been waiting to go through the legal immigration process, someone in Nigeria, someone in Ukraine, someone like that, uh, you know, who has kids who didn't come here because they didn't jump ahead of line or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, they're not very sympathetic because they're not around. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's actually a um, an abstract problem that that confronts a lot of uh, conservative policy, or is presented for a lot of conservative policy arguments in general. We talk about sort of the unseen costs of various government policies, and it's hard to point to an unseen victim, um, even if they're there. It's hard; they're hard to identify the cost, and the costs are also diffuse. So, if you know, we don't really know this for a fact, but you know, or say if, you know, higher um, legalization and higher levels of unskilled immigration is going to reduce wages probably for existing immigrants, um, you know, th that's that's a spread across a very broad number of people that aren't near, you know, aren't quite as, they're not in the media and they don't have the prominence that, that you know, just sort of particular um, groups here illegally do. Um, and so, so that's, that's a constant, uh, it's a constant problem. Another great example of this is, I mean, to be totally tangential for a moment is like higher education. So, I mean, it's possible that by giving people huge tuition tax credits, uh, or parent plus loans or a variety of these other policies that are ostensibly very generous, uh, you actually make tuition more expensive by encouraging institutions to, you know, kind of charge people more to the extent they can or whatever else. But I mean, that's very hard for people to compute. Uh, and I think that, you know, that definitely is uh, a real struggle. And it kind of relates to this kind of broader issue about, you know, where Republicans are right now, where conservatives are right now politically. Um, because, you know, right, 2014 should be a good year for conservatives politically. Uh, when you look at the Senate map, for example, um, it's just a map that in which a lot of the Senate seats that are up for grabs are in Republican states. Uh, you know, Democrats won them in 2008 because that was a wave election that was very unusual. And, you know, now it's going to return to the norm. Uh, so Republicans have an opportunity. But, you know, that, but, the, you know, we don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case. You know, all kinds of events can arise. And also this immigration debate, you know, let's say it energizes certain constituencies that might not be energized otherwise. What makes you nervous about the midterms in particular? Like, what are, you know, I guess there could be a lot of things. I mean, it could be, even if we win, there could be pitfalls to be concerned about. But I mean, short of that, I mean, you know, before the election actually happens, are there things that you worry about in particular? So another one policy issue that we were, um, that we were thinking about that I think could be a concern for Republicans sort of in, in not in the way you might think 
uh, is healthcare and Obamacare. And so I remember at some point this past winter or this spring, we had a member of uh, a Republican member of Congress uh, into national news offices, and we were talking about midterm strategy and his and we were talking about sort of what are your main issues going to be what are you worried about and his answer about what is issue, what their issue will be is sort of what made me a little worried and the answer was just we're going to talk about obamacare through november four or five or six or whatever whatever it is so over the next you know 11 months they were just going to talk about obamacare you know, and they thought that was basically going to carry Republicans to victory in all these contested races where Republicans are working on, on pretty respectable, you know, pretty friendly turf and red states and the Senate and everything. But I, I thought, I, and I don't know if I said this, but like, boy, well, what you need is you need bad headlines about Obamacare for the next 11 months. And it's certainly easy to think how, you know, boy, there was just a spoil, you know, there was just this embarrassment of riches from like October um, 2012 or October 2013 through you know March, and there were just almost no good Obamacare headlines at all. And then there started being some good ones, and then you know there was there's some good news, and conservatives would say, oh well, look, it's not nearly as good as you think. And then we, there were a lot of good points about, especially if you compare Obamacare's performance relative to the president, the promises the president made about it. It's it's really a pretty embarrassing performance. But look, they met certain metrics that they set and. Um, and now it's just sort of dropped out of, it had dropped out of the conversation completely, uh, really for sort of a lot of this summer. It's coming back now because insurer, insurers are setting rates for 2015 and where rates are rising, Republicans are using that, um, are bringing up that issue. But again, this will have to, if they think that this is going to be their issue and they're just going to talk about how bad Obamacare is, they have to hope that they're going to keep getting a ton of bad headlines. And I'm not sure that's the case. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that I think that the first few months uh, when Obamacare had various implementation disasters, in a way, that was just totally unexpected. I mean, I don't think that everyone expected that the exchanges would have, uh, you know, the difficulties that they specifically had. I mean, people had lots of abstract concerns about Obamacare, uh, you know, lots of concerns about what it would do to insurance premiums, uh, you know, et cetera. But I think that that particular set of problems almost set conservatives up for a fall because it was kind of like, yeah, you can't expect everything to be this much of a disaster. And also now some of the conversation we have around Obamacare is just so bizarre. Like, you know, there are people who are saying, well, yes, it's expanded coverage. See, I mean, that's an, well, no, I mean, that was never the debate. I mean, no one was debating whether or not it's going to expand coverage to spend billions of dollars to buy people who didn't have coverage before coverage. I mean, that, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, there was some concern that, well, actually, will this because some people are losing their insurance policies, et cetera. But that wasn't actually the debate we were having when we were actually debating the law. The question was, you know, are we actually getting our money's worth for it? Is this something that's actually going to make the health insurance marketplace work better rather than worse? But it's weird because actually, you know, the fact that Obamacare looked so disastrous in those first few months almost like changed the conversation in this way that actually moved the goalposts to the point where actually many Obamacare defenders will say, see, you know, it's not as disastrous as some people thought it was going to be uh, during those first few months, which is like just so bizarre. Yeah, I think um, it points to another sort of issue that I think con conservatives who argue, who argue about policy um, often run into, which is you hope that these policies will just utterly collapse on their own. And there was, you know, there were conservatives who were talking like, oh, it's already in a death spiral. There's, you know, it's going to be a net loss in coverage. And, you know, that that didn't happen. Um, and there's another, there's a similar, there's a parallel in the education debate with this idea that there's like a student loan bubble that's going to pop at some point, and then all, and then people will realize that we we're spending too much on education, and you know it'll all sort of come crashing down, and like we can rebuild it, you know, because liberalism can't sustain itself. Um, well, you know, it, it does sustain itself, and so then the 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 policy argument becomes that conservatives have to make, and it's just a tougher argument, but one that 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 we're you know I'd like to think we're right about is, you know, are these interventions worth it? Are they effective? And so the questions will be, you know, is uh, is the coverage that people are getting actually well suited to their needs, for, for instance? And is it worth the cost that they're paying? Is it worth, worth the cost that it's imposing on taxpayers, on people who are, uh, on people who find the market too costly to get into it now, um, you know, on, on providers? I mean, whether that's all worth it. And, and that's just, that's going to be, and, and it's going to be a tougher argument to make than, look, this is simply unworkable. But, you know, it turned out it was obviously 
possible to build a healthcare health insurance exchange and to get people signed up to it, especially if you hand them huge checks along with it. Um, but you know that's that's there, and so then what conservatives have to move into is saying, well, like, look, like we have a better way that we could you know accomplish similar goals, but in a much more sensible way, and you know in a way that will leave us freer and more prosperous and and all the rest. Yeah, I think that that's uh, very well said. There was a, a piece by David Leonhardt in the New York Times and The Upshot recently in which he was talking about the cost of college. And he was saying that, hey, the cost of college is not what you think it is uh, because actually after financial aid and whatever else, uh, you know, many low-income, moderate-income families are paying less than the sticker price of tuition. And I just you know, thought, man, this is really frustrating because what you're referring to is the net price of college. You're not referring to the cost of college, and the cost of college speaks to exactly what you're saying before. Taxpayers are accounting for part of that difference. Are taxpayers getting their money's worth? You know, I think that you could, you know, we could debate all day whether or not it's appropriate for taxpayers to subsidize higher education. You know, I happen to think that there is a case for that. But I mean, the thing is you've got to think hard about whether or not those dollars are being deployed wisely. And you know, when it's taxpayers paying for some third party's education, you know, what insight do they have into that? And then, you know, it's all going back to the higher education institution itself. And I think you see this, you know, an issue after issue. And the frustrating thing is that to exactly your point, um, you know, I think conservatives, because conservatives often have a very apocalyptic temperament, (laughs) you know, they either think that, you know, the world is doomed entirely, or they think that, you know, any scheme, uh, you know, advanced by liberals is going to collapse entirely, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is that actually, you know, the world is about muddling through. I mean, you have a lot of terrible policy in much of the world, you know, and, and it survives, you know, it's expensive, it's unpleasant, we're less rich than we would be otherwise, we have institutions that work less well than we would otherwise. But people, you know, they know the institutions they know, they're loss averse. And so I think that that's an issue, for example, a guy like Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan introduced a new anti poverty plan. And the thing is that he's proposing really different ways of doing some things. And that's fundamentally terrifying. And if you're someone who's, you know, defending the status quo, then you're able to say, well, wait a second, this is a huge departure, and it's going to be an utter disaster. And and you can't really say, well, no, it's not, because we have this, you know, and you do have some past experience you can point to or whatever else. But if you're fundamentally distrustful of Ryan or whoever else, and I think that that's another thing that is really tough. And it's kind of why I think conservatives have a trust issue with people who are not themselves conservatives, people who are swing voters or whatever else, um, you know, there's a question of actually getting people to trust that your heart is in the right place, that you want to do the right things. Um, And, you know, I think that in a way, that's the irony of the political situation we're in right now. Uh, Liberals are defending legacy institutions and conservatives increasingly, which is a great thing, but conservatives are increasingly calling for reforming and changing institutions, um, you know, to make them more compatible with the 21st century, to make them more responsive, to make them uh, more cost effective and what have you. But that involves change. And, you know, the irony is that when conservatives are calling for this kind of change, I mean, conservatives in a way, you know, a, a deep part of what we all think is that, well, you know, there's a wisdom in received institutions and inherited institutions. And now that's kind of working against us in lots of areas. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, obviously, what we think is that these, that these, the institutions that we're describing of government programs are not really institutions in the traditional sense of the word, because they, they, they were not sort of allowed, they've not been allowed to evolve, they haven't sort of been created organically, they've been imposed by, like, you know, literally 535 bureaucrats, you know, 535 politicians and then by unelected federal bureaucrats. So that what they're actually doing is interfering with natural institutions like communities and families and everything. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, not that you're suggesting this, but of course, I don't think that there is sort of a, a contradiction there. I, I, I mean, I think more what we're dealing with is just is right, but it is a fundamental, it's, it's loss aversion. It's just a sort of a fear of change. And there's this concern about basically once people have certain benefits and, you know, and, and that they're, they're going to be very jealous of them. And this is not a problem for Republicans in 2014 yet, because, um, you know, you, in a midterm election, you don't need, you know, they're not run, people are not running on, um, a platform to like sort of fundamentally change Obamacare. It's just these, uh, you know, to Ryan's and my disappointment, these elections are, are pretty light on the policy debates. Um, and so that's why Republicans are basically just running on talking about how awful Obamacare is. Um, the problem is that, that of course, it's, there is going to be this this very difficult debate about whether or not we'll be able to replace it, and and the fact that it you know say Medicare or Medicaid have been around or Social Security have been around for decades, 
and and those are sort of those are ingrained in the in the fabric of our society. People are worried about losing them. I mean, the people who have health insurance because of or via Obamacare, I wouldn't say because of Obamacare, because many of them would would you know had it or would have had it, but who have insurance via Obamacare um, are now going to be very concerned about what's going to happen to them. Um, if under a Republican alternative. And so you have to bridge that, that trust gap because people just don't trust that you'll replace it with something that's acceptable or even better. And there are ways in which I think we can try to bridge that trust gap, but, um, that will be, I think that, you know, that's, that's an issue that, that, uh, that, that will be a problem for Republicans, but, but not, a, can't be a mortal one this fall because the debate won't yet be about what to do about it. So we're about to wrap up here. And though Pat is right that we are going to talk about domestic policy issues on this podcast, I do feel compelled because I know that Pat is someone who cares a lot about foreign policy and thinks about it. Um, Pat, is the world going to hell? Like, what the hell is going on? Because you know, I, I read the news, I, I open the newspaper, I, I, and it's just like, oh my God. I mean, it seems like the entire world is erupting into flames. It is a scary place, although I saw um, so you can give. Brzezinski, uh, Jimmy Carter's, I guess Jimmy Carter's Secretary of State, said on Twitter the other day, he said, you know, we're seeing this unprecedented rise in, uh, in or unprecedented drop in state authority and unprecedented rise in disorder, disorderliness around the world. And, uh, I mean, people point out that was rather a historical statement given that, you know, for most of human history, um, states have been rather weak and uh, humans have been rather disorderly. So I think think we need to keep it all in perspective. I think Pat is reminding us of a fundamental principle that we should all abide by, which is just keep your expectations extremely, extremely low. Yes, the world is erupting into flame. But hey, you know, we used to be cavemen. Uh, you know, we used, we used to, to not have flame. We used to, we used to not even have flame or wheels or anything else. I mean, we used to beat each other with twigs. I mean, I, I still do from time to time. Uh, well, Pat, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having this. Is a start of something great. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs>